Hello, I'm Smitha Krishnaswamy, and today I'll be talking to you about some of the work in my lab involving deep learning and representation learning for problems in biology. Um, in my lab, we generally tackle big biomedical data and how to extract structure and patterns from such data. Uh, today I'll be uh, talking about a project that specifically involves COVID data from Yale. Um, so Yale New Haven hospital patients have had flow cytometry clinical data and viral genome sequencing data collected on them. Um, one of the key issues we're tackling here is how to look at this data, what level of granularity to look at this data so that we get predictive insight. And this is pretty natural for biomedical systems because they're naturally hierarchically organized. And so if you're looking for the driver of a disease, you can look at which tissue the disease origin is, or you can look at particular cell types that are causing it or particular proteins uh, that are you know, broken to create the disease. Um, so in multi, so in order to tackle this, we've created a new method called multi-scale fate. Multi-scale fate is based on our um, original fate method, which is an alternative to TSNE or PCA for dimensionality reduction and visualization. Um, the key advantage of fate is that it keeps global and local structure, so the entire organization of the data is uh, valid and shows um, continuum relationships in the data in a way that TSNE and PCA don't. TSNE, for example, can shatter the data and scramble things globally, and PCA doesn't denoise it. On this human embryonic stem cell data set from the paper, we see that only fate shows this branching differentiation structure into different lineages, like neuronal lineages, for example. We wanted to keep the advantages of fate, but also give it the ability to zoom in and out to look at different resolutions of the data. So when you're looking at a multi-scale fate embedding, you'll see something like this where you see dots of different sizes, and that's a whole bunch of data points that have been summarized into that centroid. So you get an idea also of the data density. The really exciting thing about multi-scale fate is that you can take a particular cellular population, these are T cells, for example, on the same PBMC data set, and zoom in. And when you zoom in, you see additional structure like naive cells, T regs, and NK cells. Um, and multi-scale fate is actually able to handle the number of cells that we have uh, because we've made it very highly, um, highly efficient in terms of the runtime of these. So you see it's this blue flat, flat curve. Um, the way multi-scale fate works is that on its back end, it has a process that we came up with last year called diffusion condensation. Diffusion condensation is an iterative algorithm for um, condensing data points in on one another. So here we have three Gaussians that we artificially created and you see points uh, initially uh, come close, closest to their near neighbors, and then this process continues and you get larger and larger groupings of data. But points are always uh, condensing based on a regular schedule to their diffusion neighbors, so you see all different levels of granularity here. We've already shown that this is useful in, for example, um, studying uh, which neurons form particular circuits, like a mechanosensation circuit with Daniel Ramon uh, Colon Ramos lab, uh, because we can find other neurons that are related to those circuits. So when we apply this to this 219 patient, 80 million cell data set, uh, we get a visualization like this, for example, of the PBMC data. So in order to gain predictive insight from this, we combine this multi-scale method with uh, a method that we have called MELD. Um, MELD basically involves um, initially coloring each of these cells by the status of the patient the cell came from, whether the patient went home or to rehab or if they went to hospice or died, which is in the red color. Uh, but instead of just coloring by those binary colors, it, it creates a local neighborhood density estimate out of it. So uh, the way that's done is you have a cell-cell affinity graph and uh, you can smooth the value along with the neighbors, which creates a density estimate. And this density estimate is called the EES or Enhanced Experimental Signal. And you can look at our preprint for more details. You can zoom in on a particular cluster that seems to be highly enriched for mortality. And now you can gain more insight into the substructure of these cells 
uh, and also the markers that are associated with mortality. We've done the same thing on all the different panels. So for example, the CD4 T helper cell panel, uh, we can subcluster it automatically using condensation and we can color it with EES and we've uncovered terminally differentiated T cells as one of the culprits uh, for mortality. Um, and finally, we don't just have to look at cells, we can look at entire patients with this technique. So uh, what we do is we create patient features on the basis of the clinical data, the genome sequencing data, as well as all of the cellular populations we found at all these different levels of granularity, and then we analyze it again with multi-scale fate. So you see kind of an arc like this, where uh, patients on this end are very likely to die, patients on this end are likely to survive, and there's some mixture in between. And you can do the same thing, correlate cellular proportions uh, with these. Um, we see one curious uh, group of patients that's off to the side from this trajectory. We're currently calling them the robust older women population. They're older, obese, African-American women who all survived. So we're looking at what um, cellular populations they have. Um, the uh, final ongoing uh, analysis plan for this is to actually learn dynamics from these patients because by now several of these patients have three or four time points that they have this fax data collected at and we want to learn continuous dynamics from it. So for that we're applying a trajectory net uh, which is a neural network that we just published at ICML that can model um, continuous trajectories from static snapshot data. Trajectory net uh, is a neural ODE in that it learns an ordinary differential equation uh, from the neural network instead of the function it learns the derivative. Uh, we've uh, shown it on, for example, the human embryonic stem cell data set where it um, is able to transport cells from the early days to the later days of differentiation and in the process create cellular trajectories. Um, so we've just begun to apply this to this data set. So we started applying it to these B cell trajectories and we see very interesting trends. So for example, people have thought that interferon response, for example, interferon gamma is an inflammatory cytokine and that might be very high in patients who uh, died, but the patients who died are in orange and the trajectory shows that actually they have an initial spike followed by a decrease. And so there's a lot of non-monotonic and divergent trends here. Uh, for example, the amount of T cells dips in these patients much faster than others uh, that we're still trying to mine. Uh, we have, um, and so we have a lot of different methods like this. I talked about one or two methods, but we have a lot of methods like this in our lab. If you're interested in learning more about it, you can go to our website or download our software and let me know if you have any other questions.